Ammunition presented by the army matches bullet shells recovered at the Lekki toll gate, says an expert, while civil society group cries out that 300 Lagos NSAS protesters are suffering in detention. And name terrorism sponsors to clear your name, Middle Belt Forum challenges federal government. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anacorn. A forensic expert, Joseph Coyote, has told the Lagos Judicial Panel of Inquiry in the investigation of the Lekki Tollgate shooting incident that the samples of the ammunition presented by the Nigerian army are the same caliber as those retrieved at the scene. He gave this explanation while giving the ballistic reports to, of the forensic investigation conducted on the ammunition presented by the Nigerian army and those at the panel. Meanwhile, a civil society group, New Nigerian Network, has asked the Lagos State Government and other authorities to release the 300 NSAS protesters in detention unconditionally or take them to court. The co-convener of the group, Adishina Ogulona, said that during, he said it during a visit to the prison by members of the group, they saw NSAS protesters wait, wasting away in prison. Well, joining us to discuss this is Ini Barefyong, he's a human rights lawyer. Jonathan Abang is a journalist and Michael Nketia is an international relations and political uh, analyst. He's joining us from Ghana. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. Thank you for having us on the show, Ryan. Great. I'm going to start with you, Nibaga, because you are one of those who have been uh, very vocal about this, uh, the NSAS campaign, uh, at which turned into a protest and, and then, of course, the, the aftermath and... Now we have been um, talking about the outcome of the panel, the investigative panel. And here we are today talking about this particular um, ammunition. Now we remember that uh, during the panel sessions, the army at first claimed that they were using blanks. And then at another sitting, the army admitted to having some um, ammunition that was not necessarily blanks, but this particular expose is saying that the, black, the, the, the ammunition that was used um, matches the one that the army was given or was using on the day at the toll gate. So the, the big question for, on everybody's mind is, so what then, what now happens now that we have this information? Because it seemed like everybody went to sleep, but now this has literally opened a new kind of warm. So where do we go? Marianne, for me, there is nothing surprising in the testimony by the ballistic experts. I was before the Lagos Judicial Panel of Inquiry, the Commission of Inquiry, on the day that uh, General Taiwo testified. I was part of the team of lawyers who represented some of the protesters at the toll gates. And it was very obvious to us, it was very clear to us, that the military authorities were lying to the public, were lying to Nigerians, and that they were not honest with their role at the toll gate, with the things that they did at the toll gate. There was never doubt about the fact that the military invaded the Lake toll gate, that they attacked unarmed protesters, that people were killed in that process. These things have now been proven, but there has been a chain of lies, both by the government, the Lagos state government, the federal government, and the military authorities on their role in the matter, from denying outrightly that they never even that they were never present at the toll gate. They were then forced to admit that oh, soldiers were there. They, they subsequently said, oh, they never fired a shot. Nobody was targeted. And of course, they subsequently admitted that indeed people were targeted, that they had fired shots, but that nobody was killed. But don't forget that even the governor of Lagos State did admit, he did admit that at least 
two persons. He confirmed that at least a few persons were killed. So when we cross-examined him, the truth came out at the commission of inquiry. It is unfortunate that you know we still have to even debate whether people were murdered or not. The reality is that people were killed at the toll gate. And I have also seen some of the victims. And you have interacted with witnesses who were present on, at the toll gate on that date. But so this revelation further, it is only further substantiates what we have always known. There is nothing strange, there is nothing unusual in the evidence given by the ballistic expert. But but you know what it, you know the saying that you know if you do not have proof, you do not have facts, then you cannot you know pull, push a particular. Uh, let's say for you, you said you already knew there was that that they were lying, but then of course anybody can say that the army is lying except you have proof and now we do have proof because i i remember there was a time when the even the army was asking that if they indeed killed anybody or there were victims we, we should produce those victims or the protesters should produce the victims so i'm asking again um this is a panel that is not necessarily uh, empowered by the law to prosecute or you know go further in, they, they're just listening they're just investigating and they're hearing so now that we have proof, I'm asking again, what are the legal steps that need to be taken? Because I'm asking this because this situation seems to have taken a back burner because um, maybe for some reason there was not enough foolproof evidence to take the army up or maybe take even the federal government up on this particular issue. But now we have enough proof. So what is the way forward? What I want you to, what I, the point I'm trying to make to you is that I was present during the form of the sittings of that panel, particularly on the day that the military gave their evidence. The evidence that the military itself stated that was evidence that implicated them. Their own evidence implicated them. They also made a series of admissions against interest. There is what we lawyers call admission against interest. That is where somebody is considering the fact that is not in the interest of that person. That goes to show that that person had the bad keys. Mm -hmm. So even by the by the evidence of the military itself, it was clear that contrary to what they had said earlier, that they were present at the two gates and that they targeted civilians, unarmed civilians. There was never evidence that those people at the at the two gates were armed. They even admitted, the military admitted, General Taiwo admitted that the protesters were not armed. Now to your question, I don't want us to be over optimistic about what is going to be done by these findings. At the end of the day, the Judicial Commission of Inquiry will submit its reports and make recommendations. Whether those recommendations will be implemented is a different thing entirely. But given the antecedents of this regime, I am convinced that it is very unlikely that any of those soldiers will ever be caught martial or put on trial. Because this is a regime that has shown itself unwilling to abide by the rule of law, a regime that has shown continuous contempt for human life, a regime that does not have any respect for international best practices and rules of engagement. So you don't expect that regime, a regime that has lied on record about the activities at the toll gate, to now take a somersault and implement whatever findings this commission is going to make. But let us wait and see. I'm just telling us that we shouldn't be over optimistic. At the end of the day, let us hope that even the panel will have the courage to make far-reaching recommendations. Because on the basis of what we know alone, it is sufficient for actions to be taken. But because as a country, we have this culture of always setting up commissions of inquiries on issues. That is why we keep having committee after committee, panel after panel, judicial in inquiry after judicial inquiry. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, very little is done in terms of implementation, in terms of sanction, in terms of consequence for people who have committed infraction against the law. That is why I am saying that Nigeria should not be over optimistic about this panel. Do not forget that even the military at a point withdrew from participating in this commission of inquiry. They refused, they refused to honor certain someone that we issued on them. That is not a government, that is not a regime that you will want us to believe is going to pay attention to the outcome of this inquiry. Hmm. As far as I am concerned, the events that have taken place even while this panel is sitting, the freezing of the account of inside protesters, the persecution of some of the protesters, including those who are being placed on watch lists, the target on NGOs who were involved in this, but all this goes to show you 
the insincerity of the government, the fact that nothing has been done about police reform to date, the fact that policemen are still killing people across the country. Look at what is going on. That clearly shows you that this is not a government that has even taken the fact that that protest took place seriously. So don't okay. expect much. We shouldn't expect much from this commission of inquiry in terms of implementation. Well, Jonathan, I'm going to toss it to you because you're a journalist. I'm sure that you are one of the people who covered um, this story over and over again. Journalists were front and center, uh, you know, uh, during the protests after, and of course, the, the stories that came um, following it. So, anybody is giving us a somewhat of a doom and gloom expectation. In fact, is saying that we should not be over overly optimistic as to the outcome of this. But as a journalist, um, we're, we're the fourth uh, state of the realm, and we're supposed to push for these uh, kinds of stories or push for these issues to be attended to and get both the public and government's attention uh, for justice to be meted on those who deserve it. Um, so if, a, if, for example, anybody is saying we shouldn't be optimistic, where does, the, where does the media come in? How do you deal with a situation such as this? Uh, thank you, Mariana. Now, the problem where I've come to discover with Nigeria is that the attention span is really uh, very short. And um, it's uh, terrible because uh, you find yourself in a situation where you go all out and try to get a perspective from uh, the different people that make up that story, that the different uh, angles to it and at the end of the day someone would just ask you why even stress yourself uh, it, it even is not far from the truth uh, in fact he's actually telling the truth because when you look at what happened with the uh, uh report submitted by the national human rights commission to the inspector general of police uh, to the attorney general of the federation who just sat down and looked at it and it's like well there's nothing much here uh, and pushed it back to the inspector general of police uh, to even investigate again which is rather funny uh, when you go around the country where in states where they have set up these judicial panels of inquiry, about two or three have wrapped up and none of the recommendations have been made public. Take, for instance, in Cross River State, it's uh, over four months now since uh, the uh, judicial panel of inquiry uh, into police brutality and other related matters uh, ended. There is no information as to when uh, the uh, recommendations will be made public and if they will ever be made public and what have you. So for the i think what we have to do as journalists uh, deliberately like uh, for my uh, video outfit we have continued dogging after the heels of members of uh, these uh, judicial panels of inquiry to find out from them exactly when they are going to make uh, uh, these uh, uh, recommendations public and aside that we also have to hold the uh, chief executive of uh, state executive councils you know the governors who set up these judicial uh, panels uh, in, in fact when you look at apart from probably lagos and i think uh, river state other states say it was just the governors uh, at, at their whims and caprices setting up uh, these panels whosoever they felt like in cross river state some people were chosen and no one knows how they were chosen there was no female representation there was no gender balance you know the youth representation was really mean and what have you there was nobody from the civil society nothing like that so it's actually a doom yeah the very very gloomy picture but as journalists our duty of course is continue asking questions and of course people usually come up and say okay the problem with journalists is that uh, there are very few investigative journalists out there and they, if you go they'll tell you okay you move from one story to the other but we need to start questioning the answers we receive from uh, uh, you know uh, public office holders and what have you to ensure that people really get uh, uh, justice. But believe me, this issue uh, from my analysis is going to take like two plus years, and probably by uh, the the third quarter of next year, people will even just forget about it and be focusing uh, on 2023 because that's what we'll be selling at that point in time. You, you, you just literally played into what I was going to ask next because it's people i hear people say all the time they say it to me they say it to other journalists that we play a part in you know burying some of these stories we never con we, no, we we don't follow up that's the word there is no follow up for example um you know we only jump on stories when they're hot and they're sensational and right after that it dies down we forget about it and we jump on to we wait for the uh, political parties or the politicians to make the news for us to report on it uh, and so we play a part somewhat maybe uh, in killing these stories. I, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, let's not forget that as we speak about this protest, it's also one of the reasons why we do not have Twitter in Nigeria right now. I remember the inf information minister saying that um, 
Jack was sponsoring somewhat um, these protests to try to topple the government. So these two are connected. Now, nobody's also talking about the fact that Twitter has been banned for 100 plus days. Nothing has been said. No going forward. Uh, we don't even know what, you know, if there's ever going to be Twitter until this administration is over. And so it obviously means that the government does have an interest, but we, the media, are not trying to push for more, for the questions to be asked. I'm, I'm wondering asked. why that is. There are a couple of reasons, of course. Uh, you know, it spans from uh, ownership influence, uh, the bias of omission, the bias of selection, uh, you know, uh, how stars, and of course, uh, repressive. Uh, when you have a repressive regime like the one we have right now, uh, it becomes uh, terrible. I, uh, in the past uh, two years, I've been in court uh, about three, four times. I've had about uh, 12 letters written to my office and addressed some to me, some to my publisher, and some to my colleagues. Uh, you know, accusing us of uh, libel and uh, what have you, and you know, after we publish stories, so it's it's a whole lot. Not so many journalists will want to really dog after the heels of uh, people to ask questions and then even question the answers that uh, uh, they receive. But beyond that, now let, let me uh, let me put this uh, this way. Now, imagine Plus uh, TV Africa is talking about it, uh, this now on Plus Politics, right? Uh, what's the time span you have to really discuss uh, these issues? The program is 24 hours, right? So at some point in time, you have to balance because you are not just focusing on uh, the human interest story. You have to go political a bit. You have to do agro. You have to do the healthcare uh, sector. You have to do education as well. Like, there are some states who have even postponed the resumption of uh, schools, uh, you know, across the country. So it's it's a whole lot. And then you look at the newspapers, for instance. So a newspaper that has what that two pages, it publishes that two pages. Uh, they, they need uh, some certain adverts, advertorials to uh, stay afloat and what have you. So all these things is a whole gamut uh, that really leads, uh, causes this. But so you're telling course, me that the hands of the media is tied under a democracy, a government that we call a democracy. You're saying that our hands are tied because we still go cap in degree. hand to these politicians to be able to pay with salaries with and fees. Exactly. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. It's quite unfortunate, but I'll leave it there. Let me, let me go to um, our international um, relations expert. Now, Michael, uh, I know that you've been watching from the outside um, to see all that's been playing out in Nigeria. The whole world saw what happened on October 20, 2020, uh, and you know the, the aftermath of that um, protest at the Lekki Toll. Uh, you and I spoke a couple of days ago, and, and, and you expressed uh, some... Um, the satisfaction as to how the issue has been handled so far. But judging from what you've heard from our, our two guests, where do you think this is all going? Well, thanks again for having me on the show. It is said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And it needs emphasizing that the ability or the willingness of the Nigerian youth and the Nigerian population to win back the confidence of the country's military, police, and other security forces would be very critical in the security agency's response to the Lekki Boots scandal or, let's say, massacre. I'm very surprised, and it is quite an embarrassment for the Nigerian army, that the sh uh, shell case that they presented for live ammunition do not match with that, that was picked by the panel 10 days after the incident at the tow boot. And this clearly, uh, clearly demonstrates that there is some form of covert attempt to massage or determine the outcome of the sitting of the panel by presenting what appears to be a deliberately created false evidence or materials to, to, to sway public outcome or influence the outcome of the panel or committee sittings. It is quite unfortunate. They, what happened at Lekki Boot, with all certainty to international law, constitutes crimes against humanity, firing at unarmed protesters, and going beyond that, beyond the killing, trying to present false evidence to sway public perception, to change the outcome. And there were even instances where the army appeared to suggest that the innocent protesters rather fired at the military men. Initially, there was a denial that there were no military men, nobody was shot, nobody was killed. 
we fired only uh, blank ammunition, and then later on there is an admission that we fired live am ammunition. This clearly tells us that from day one, there has been a deliberate attempt by the Nigerian army to cover up the Tobu, the, the Lekki Togate incident. And it is in the interest of the Nigerian government to apologize to the Nigerian people, to apologize to the youth. And as a matter of urgency, free the innocent people that have been incarcerated to date. Those whose human rights continue to be violated by constant harassment by state security agents on the sole basis that they participated in the in the in the demonstrations. If people should be arrested and, and jailed, it should be the military men and other security agents who shot at the unarmed civilians. The protesters only demonstrated because they, they sought for a better Nigeria where the youth would be free from oppression and intimidation by state security agencies. At the basis of security, at the basis of state security, is the concept of assurance. Every manner of security is supposed to provide some form of assurance to the citizens and populace that regardless of where you are, no matter the time that you are, you should be safe in your own country. Mm -hmm. And if citizens are not safe in their own country, then it is a big problem for any government. Already Nigeria is battling with the insurgency of militants, of jihadists, of terrorists. Today I read in the news that there's been another attack on a jail or a prison somewhere in Nigeria. Guards have been killed, inmates have been set free. You read so many horrifying stories coming out of, the, of Nigeria. If the government wants to really, really address the insecurity in Nigeria, First, it needs the goodwill and support of the people. The government should not antagonize the very people that are supposed to give it the right moral backing and support to address the country's insecurity. The Nigeria's army, police, whatever, the Department of State Security, if they have anything worthy of doing to guarantee the sovereignty of the state by providing security, for every member, every citizen of Nigeria, then they should channel their energy and resources in tackling the rampant abuse of militancy, jihadism, activities of terrorism, brutalities, the kidnapping of innocent schoolgirls and schoolboys. But Michael, they, but Michael, from what from all that you, I mean, yes, you're reading these things on the pages of newspapers, but we're the ones who are experiencing it. Uh, in the past, in, in fact, in the past few months, even into the, the, the year before now, uh, there have been all kinds of um, uh, bills that have been passed to either try to limit the media, and now you also know about the fact that Twitter has been um, put down, obviously. This is a venting place for most Nigerians. This is where most people find their voices to speak about the um, you know, things that are happening and the injustices that we're experiencing in the country. Now, how do we, going forward, because, again, I keep emphasizing that we're, we're in a democracy. We're not in a military dispensation. We're in a democracy, supposedly. Um, and the rights, the voices, the displeasures of the average Nigerian is, is not being heard by our leaders. And for every time the people decide that they want to protest, because this is the only tool that you can use to get the attention of those who lead you, especially if you are um, displeased with how they're leading, that particular right is being trampled upon. As, as it is right now, protests seem to be somewhat banned in this country, even though there is, there's no legal backing to that. But every time Nigerians try to go out to protest, the police shows up and arrests people. How do we want to get development? How do we want to move forward? Because you've mentioned that it, the government needs one way or the other to be in the good books of the average Nigerian, but that is not happening. If the, we have a government that's not listening to us, where do we go from here? Well, first, I believe that it is in the interest of the Nigerian government to allow the youth to vent their anger on social media than for the youth to breed their anger internally. It is very dangerous when this anger explodes because when people keep things inside them and they definitely get to a breaking point, a to the limits, it, it, it becomes difficult to contain them. And any explosion, any likely explosion by the Nigerian youth would be very difficult to curtail. 
However, I would urge the Nigerian citizenry not to give up on its demand for a better Nigeria, not to give up on the demand for the expression of basic human rights. It is their fundamental human right to free expression. And any government that is afraid of the, 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 the descent of its own very people, even on social media, it should, 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 should be extremely worried. Because, listen, this is a country with over 170, 200 million population. Majority of this population is its youth. And the basic medium where the youth communicate all over the world today is social media. And that one popular platform that they use to communicate their grievances, you are taking that platform from them. Basically, what you are doing is that you are denying them the opportunity to even express dissent. And this anger is likely to degenerate or escalate to a boiling point where the Nigerian army may not be able to contain. The quick, youth quick, quickly, Michael, because, because we're almost out of time, so I can get a uh, you know, few last words in from the, the other guys. As we speak, the United States Senate put a pause on the sale of military um, equipment to Nigeria. Now, the reason, one of the reasons why, in fact, the biggest reason why they have paused that sale is because they're pointing to human rights issues, human rights abuses. They're talking about high-handedness by the army. And here we are talking about the army owning up to what happened at the Lekki Toll. And you, you've mentioned about us having to deal with insecurity. Will we ever get to the point where we can really fight insecurity in our country if the people who are supposed to help us in fighting that insecurity do not trust our army to fight insecurity without human rights issues arising maybe for the obtained time? Well, um, I believe that there can be a way for Nigeria to address insecurity like you earlier raised. You see, that is the problem with high-handed governments. Currently, the Nigerian government needs needs these uh, uh, weapons to confront rising jihadism, militancy, and the threat of Boko Haram. And because he decided to use these weapons on its own citizens, there is a, light, there is a ban by the U.S. government on the sale of weapons. Although Nigeria can get these weapons from the international market, so obviously they can buy from the Russians, the Chinese. However, it affects the country's credibility and international standing and prestige. A government that unleashes violence, intimidation, treachery on its own citizens when jihadists and militants are terrorizing the country in other parts. These are some of the issues that needs to be addressed. And I believe that for Nigeria to really resolve its issue of insecurity, it needs the collaboration of all stakeholders. Those seeking to secede from Nigeria should be brought to the drawing board you should not arrest the leaders of the secession movement. I'm, 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 a, I'm an international law practitioner. I'm against any, any group of people or any people hoping to secede from a country. But if you really want to achieve peace in your country, you don't arrest the leaders of these secession movements. Bring them to the negotiation table. Try to understand them from their point of view. If they are expressing sentiments of underdevelopment, of economic deprivation, try and extend development to their respective regions or states. These are some of the things. These are the fundamental things that can bring Nigeria back to a state of security. Right. Address religious tensions. Enough of the religious conflicts between Christians and Muslims, the divide between the North and South. Address these fundamental yeah. issues. Once you are able to address these issues, you, you have a quorum or a forum of people, diverse ethnic groups, diverse We have to go. Are ready to move on with for a common Nigeria. We have to go. Unfortunately, the time is not on our side, but I want to say thank you. Inibere Fiong is a human rights lawyer. Uh, Michael Nketia is an international uh, relations and security experts and of course jonathan abang is a journalist thank you gentlemen for lending your voice to this conversation thank you thank you thank you all right we will we'll take a short break thank you all for staying with us when we return the federal government has been encouraged to reveal the sponsors of boko haram who are they we'll get to find out after this break